I am Dr. Professor P.C. Monoria, Executive President, Third World Congress, Cardiometabolic Medicine, Mumbai, 27-28 January at Hotel Lille. And with me is uh, Professor Narula, President-elect World Heart Federation, and a doyen of uh, imaging and also a great clinician. So Dr. Narula, all of us know ACVD is the leading cause of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality is rampant in India rather it is reaching alarming in epidemic proportions, very high mortality. We see myocardial infarction a decade earlier. We see diabetes a decade earlier. The disease is malignant, more frequent revascularization and so on. So what is the root cause of all this in the Indian context? Whichever context you may talk of, whether it is Indian context or you go to any country, you go to any continent, it is all about the coronary risk factors. And uh, the... Uh, if you normalize uh, for the risk factors, the age would be no difference whether it is in India or anywhere else. So the root cause obviously is the risk factors. And when I have uh, always talked about the uh, risk factors, I always said that we normally say that uh, our uh, uh, increase in the risk factors is at a borderline level. And that is what is something which our physicians tell you all the time. That is what the patients feel. And they feel quite happy about it that their blood pressure is only borderline elevated or their sugar is borderline elevated or their cholesterol is borderline elevated. There's nothing like a borderline elevated thing here. The most important thing is that it is the multiple risk factors with their minimal or modest elevation is much worse than the extreme elevation of a single risk factor. And we really need to need to be aware of that. So that is one important thing that we must realize. The second thing that we need to realize about the risk factors is that we have often been discussing and changing the normal values of uh, various risk factors. The problem is that the normal values of the risk factors are indeed the usual values of the risk factors which we have seen in the epidemiological studies, which are of the population that is at a higher risk of developing the vascular events or higher risk of dying from the vascular events. Then the other important thing is then when we talk about the aging as our risk factors, the fact remains that the aging is the length of exposure to risk factors and if we age healthy, we age better. And finally, the risk factors that I always talk about is the genetics, that we blame genetics as one of the non-modifiable risk factors. But the fact remains that if we take care of other risk factors or modifiable risk factors, we'll be able to mitigate the genetic risk also to a significant extent. So if I conclude here, I would like to say that it is all about risk factors, whichever context we are in, be it in India or beyond. So, Dr. Narula, are there any communities in the world where ACVD is very less? Uh, I think you can answer that uh, question in a very uh, c categorical way or a classified way. That uh, there are certain places where obviously there is a genetic, uh, uh, priv genetically privileged communities. For example, you will talk about the APOA1 Milanos or the communities where the PCSK9 loss of function is seen. So there obviously the risk will be very low. Then there are places where the risk factors are less. For example, Japan, where the other than hypertension, you basically have very low risk factors because of their better lifestyle and uh, better dietary uh, behaviors. However, when these people start to move to the other places like to Hawaii or Hawaii to the US mainland and all, their risk is uh, continues to increase. Then you will have the countries where the risk used to be very high or the prevalence used to be very high and they made some significant changes. For example, in uh, Finland, there they were able to reduce the, uh, the likelihood of having the disease. And finally, you will talk about those where the prevalence is very high because the risk factors are high. So essentially, it is uh, when we discuss about the prevalence, it is all about having the risk factors and uh, the extent of risk factors. LDL is causally related to atherosclerosis. So what do you think should be the level of LDLs? 
Uh, it's a very contentious question. Uh, the reason is that uh, we have always talked about the risk factors uh, as uh, the normal values. And as uh, I have always been talking about it, that the normal values of any risk factors have been determined by the epidemiological studies. And they have been the usual factors or the usual levels of the populations which are at a premature risk of dying from the vascular events. So we basically have been bringing the levels down, but in a very slow manner. It used to be 130 LDL, then we came to 110 and 190 and 70, now 50s, 40s and 30s that uh, we have been talking about. But the fact remains that when you talk about the LDL levels, I always say it, although it is not supported by the guidelines at this point in time, but uh, I have always said that our level should be what we are born with. And uh, we are born with 25 to 30 milligram percent of uh, LDL. And all the animals in the world also have something similar that we look at. And uh, basically, now the European Society of Cardiology has started to say that when you are at a very high risk, you should be able to bring your levels to under uh, 40. Okay. And then if you look at various primary prevention trials and the secondary prevention trials, you realize that if you have to extrapolate the line of a relationship between the LDL cholesterol levels and the likelihood of having an event, for primary prevention, you need to bring the LDL down to 55 for having a zero cardiovascular event. And if you similarly extend or extrapolate your line in the secondary prevention trials, you might have to go down to 30. So is that the level? Hard to say, but that probably is the case. What is your LDL level? <laughs> My LDL level has been in 20s. And uh, the inspiration, as I was always said, is Dr. Braunwald, because uh, there is no confidentiality breach here. And uh, as he has always said, that he is the longest surviving human being on the uh, statins. And uh, his levels have always been uh, in 20s. So we follow him both from the academic perspectives as well as his practical guidelines. The problem is we have several oral medications. The problem with oral medication, even with the PCSK9 monoclonal body, is of adherence and uh, compliance. So most of the people, unless it is fixed into their brain that this would decrease your MI and other atherosclerotic events, they don't take it regularly. Right. So now this inclusion has come. So how do you look upon an inclusion for this purpose? Because only two shots a year. So the onus is on us that we really have to convince the patients that they need to decrease it. And they have to understand that the reduced levels are going to really help them. Problem is that uh, most of the risk factors, they basically are asymptomatic because there is no manifestations of them. And once we start to treat them, there is a possibility of making them more symptomatic. And that is where the compliance starts to fall. So when it comes to the cholesterol reduction or the lipid lowering agents is concerned, the statins and then some associated side effects which have been by media or by some people, they have been exaggerated beyond uh, the real uh, uh, prevalence of the, of the risk factors. So obviously we have gone to the PCSK9 inhibition and all which could be like once every two weeks or once every four weeks but that also has not uh, really uh, that also would not probably help in terms of the compliance. But as you ask about the Inclisiran, I believe that the Inclisiran is the uh, better way or Inclisiran is a more physiologic way of uh, reducing the uh, cholesterol because you are nipping it at the origin. You are nipping it in the bud itself. And uh, before even the PCSK9 is formed, before... Um, uh, the uh, the uh, PCSK9 is produced and then you are giving the antibodies to remove them. I definitely agree that the inclisiran would have a significant impact. And for that matter, any mRNA therapeutics that are coming in, you now look at the, for the hypertension also, the possibility of using zelbesiran and uh, agents like that. So, or what is going to be coming for the LP little a reduction also as well. I think the mRNA therapeutics are going to have a significant say in uh, the prevention of the disease because once or twice a year, something to be taken 
may be much easier and uh, may be easier to convince the patients to follow that. Uh, what is this polygenic risk score and how it is useful in the Indian context? So, the, as far as the Indian context is concerned, I have not been able to follow the literature well in uh, uh, Indian context. But otherwise, the polygenic risk score, as you see that the number of, uh, the increasing number of the mutations obviously keeps on, to, keeps on adding the uh, likelihood of having the disease. And when you have a significantly large number of changes, you basically can match your uh, uh, the, uh, likelihood scores or the, uh, the odds ratios or hazard ratios to the same level as you might find with the monogenic uh, 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 genetic mutations. So basically, the role of uh, the polygenic risk scores is continuing to emerge. Uh, the more important thing would be that uh, we would now, as we are going with the whole exam or whole genome sequencing, uh, basically we would be finding more and more changes, whether these are the protective or the uh, causative um, uh, genetic uh, mutations. And with the AI use now becoming much more prevalent, we should be able to tease out the uh, way we look at the genetic predisposition to disease. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Jagat Nagar, for the excellent takeaways. Thank you. Thank you.